Hello, today we're looking at our final lesson in Unit 7, The Search for Peace, in our study of the USA between 1929 and the year 2000. Today we're going to be looking at Iran, Iraq, and the relations between the USA and the USSR. And our learning objective is to understand how those relationships between the two superpowers during the Cold War started to change for the better. Now your starter is to complete the following quick fire statements. So copy and complete these into your notebook. Uh, you'll need to write down numbers one to five and finish off each of those statements. So Berlin was divided in two, Kennedy versus the Cuban Missile, we need to talk about what that was, satellites with lasers, uh, and China versus USA in a friendly match. So please do write your title learning objective, finish off those starter statements, and when you're finished, go ahead and resume playing the video. So let's take a look at our quick fire questions. Uh, Berlin was divided in two. We know it was four zones. We had Britain, France, the USA, and the Soviet Union. Kennedy, well, he was up against Nikita Khrushchev. It was called the Cuban Missile Crisis in October of 1962. Satellites with lasers, Star Wars, and finally, China versus the USA in a friendly match. We called this ping pong diplomacy. So next up, we have five key terms. We have the Mujahideen, we have Soviet, Gorbachev, Perestroika, and Glasnost. You can see there are different key terms at the bottom in red. Please do go ahead and pause the video now, match those up. You can do so by doing a quick internet search or just a process of elimination. Uh, or if you do have a USA textbook handy, you're more than welcome to use that. So have a go at matching those up. Any you're not sure of, leave them for the time being, and we'll take them up in a moment. So you've had a chance to look at your key terms. Mujahideen, this is an anti-communist fighting group in Afghanistan, and they were actually supported by the CIA. That's the Central Intelligence Agency in the USA. Soviet, we refer to the USSR, or what we call modern-day Russia. Gorbachev, he was the first president of Russia. He worked alongside Ronald Reagan for peace during the Cold War. Perestroika, this was Gorbachev's plan to repair the Soviet economy that was suffering heavily because they were spending so much money on their military to try to compete with that of America. And finally, Glasnost was to stop censorship of the press. Uh, that was a big issue in the Soviet Union in the late 1980s, uh, where newspapers felt they could not publish what they wanted to because of government control. So allowing Glasnost uh, further improved not only the, the element of truth that was shared within the Soviet Union, but understanding with other countries around the world. So context, the USA and the Soviet Union, they were still engaged in the Cold War in the late 1970s. We know that there was some serious bad blood between those two nations. Now, even though Nixon had paid his very famous visit to China, tensions were still quite high because both sides had nuclear weapons. And it wasn't a case of Nixon going to China suddenly made everything better between the USA and communist nations. They still had those nuclear weapons, so there was still the threat of a nuclear war. Now, we know the SALT agreements, they were trying to help to stop in the production of nuclear arms. This was called the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaties. Uh, but it wasn't reducing the total number held by each side fast enough. So there was still a bit of concern between both sides that they had nuclear weapons um, and their enemies did as well. And there was still that possibility of a conflict. And they both still had a bit of a score to settle. So neither the USA or the USSR actually wanted to declare a formal war on each other. They knew that, that could be quite detrimental. So they used a conflict in Afghanistan to settle their differences. And we call this type of conflict a proxy war. So it's not as though the Soviet Union and USA formally declared war on each other. They were fighting against each other through a conflict in Afghanistan. So go ahead and pause the video. Let's get those highlighted points into our note. When you're finished, resume playing. So before we get any further into our lesson, we do need to do a little bit of reading. So a great time now is to pause the video so you can see the text on screen. Uh, have a read of this slide about changing relations with the Soviet Union. No need to take notes at this point. Uh, and when you're finished with this slide, go into the next and we'll have one more quick reading to look at. So just the same as before, go ahead and pause the video now. Have a quick read of the reaction of President Carter. Uh, once you're finished with that, you can resume playing.
Now, this is where things get quite interesting. In 1978, communist groups seized power in a revolution in Afghanistan. And we know that the USA had a policy that would essentially encourage them to get involved to stop the spread of communism. And we know that that policy is called containment. So by all accounts, America now has to get an American force of soldiers, send them over to Afghanistan to fight against the communists to stop the spread of communism. But this is where things start to change. The USA decides not to get involved. Now, opposition in Afghanistan actually fights back against the communists. So the Americans don't actually have to send soldiers. The, the Mujahideen are going to do the fighting for them. Now, in December of 1979, Soviet troops enter Afghanistan in support of the communists. And the reason is the USA doesn't want to upset the USSR. Relations are slowly getting better. On any other account in any other time in history, if we go back to the 1950s or 60s, the USA clearly would have sent forces to confront the Soviet Union. But because they're getting closer to reaching an agreement, nuclear war is slowly de-escalating, the Americans have decided, let's not do anything to further upset the Soviet Union. Now, as you can imagine, that secret involvement would lead to later conflict, and that's where the Iranian hostage crisis becomes a topic of our conversation. So we have four key players in the Iranian hostage crisis, and they are as follows. We have the Shah of Iran, Ronald Reagan, Ayatollah Khamenei, and we have Jimmy Carter. So what we'll do is we'll record the following names into our notes, because these are going to be the four key players in that crisis we're going to discuss in a few moments. Now, the situation in Iran uh, isn't that great either. From 1953 to 1979, the U.S. backed the Shah of Iran as he attempted to modernize and westernize Iran. And the USA was in support of this because it supported their policy of containment. They were trying to convert Iran, who could have gone either way. They could have become capitalists and they could have become communists, uh, finding that more capitalist westernized view. Uh, what they would do is they would support the Shah of Iran uh, with foreign policies, they would support him with financial incentives, and that was for him to make decisions that favored the USA. Now, this led to many of the Shah's friends becoming extremely wealthy, while most Iranians at the time were quite poor. And there was this view of corruption within the government, where poor people saw the Shah of Iran going around in his fancy cars, uh, with all of his wealth, and his friends as well in government were also very wealthy. Uh, so this whole view of corruption uh, would eventually lead to a potential revolution in the country. Now that revolution is going to take place in 1979, and there was a religious fundamentalist, that's someone who really takes religion kind of literally. His name was Ayatollah Khamenei. He's going to overthrow the Shah, and he declared the USA as the great Satan of the world. He was really against any kind of westernization. He declares himself leader for life, uh, and he creates the Islamic Republic of Iran. Now, we have to think what the USA reaction would be to this. So we had a country that was relatively westernized, relatively capitalist, uh, and they've been overthrown in favor of a political party that sees communism and religious fundamentalism as the new reality. So let's get to the crisis. Now, we know that the Shah was seen as being very corrupt. He was overthrown and he was expelled from Iran. Now, President Carter, who was you know, friendly with the Shah, allowed him to go to the USA for cancer treatment. And this is where many Iranian students said, the USA is getting involved in our affairs. We got rid of the Shah of Iran. We're finally happy to have a, a less corrupt government, if you will. Uh, and in protest, Iranian students stormed the US embassy and they held U.S. citizens captive there for over 444 days. So we'll want to get down these four points here about the crisis itself. This took place in 1979, and this was all because President Carter allowed the Shah to go to Iran for cancer treatment. So let's get those four points in our note, and then we can resume playing. Now, a good question is, how did the students actually get inside? Because typically embassies are relatively heavily guarded. And we can see here a picture of the American embassy. Uh, this is in Iran, and it hasn't really changed a whole lot since 1979. We can see a really high fence going around the outside. Uh, it would be very difficult to actually scale that, because if we have a, a closer look at the tops of the fence here, you can see it's very sharp. And nothing's even. There's nothing to really hang on to, and it's quite high. If, if we're saying that this 
individual here is probably about six feet tall, uh, you're looking at roughly a, a 10 to 12 foot fence to climb. So it's going to be quite difficult to do. Now here's how they actually managed to do it. They squeezed in between uh, these fences here these poles. So it was very difficult to get in, but once they did, they overpowered some of the guards. Once they obtained weapons, they were able to take uh, the citizens in there hostage, and it was for over a year. We have to remember 444 days. So now we're going to just head forward a couple of years after the Iranian hostage crisis, and we're going to have a look at President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev of the Soviet Union. We're going to have a look at Mr. Ronald Reagan. Now, he was a movie star before being president. Uh, he was elected in the year 1980. We talked about Reaganomics. He's going to lower taxes. He's going to have the trickle-down effect. The wealthy will spend more money. We know it didn't work, and we know he racked up a massive, massive debt. But one of the good things about him, he was very tough on the Soviet Union and the Russians living in the USA. He was very tough in terms of his foreign policy. He wanted peace, and he said no more nuclear weapons. Now, he's one of the first presidents, actually, to go from a, a kind of a life of fame into politics. So he used to be a movie star. And that might, might remind us of someone else that we're familiar with. We can put his picture up here. Someone else who came from more of the business world and the celebrity world into a position of leadership in the USA. So let's have a look at the Strategic Defense Initiative, SDI, also known as Star Wars. So it was satellite-based lasers. This was Reagan's big idea as to how he was going to end the Cold War. This put the USA ahead of the Soviet Union in terms of their technological uh, advancement in their weaponry. It was extremely expensive for the USA, which really didn't help very much considering the economic policies put in place by Reagan a few years earlier. And we have to think how the USSR would react to Reagan's plan. What would they think about this fancy new technology called Star Wars? The next for us to look at is Mr. Gorbachev. So he became Soviet leader in 1985, and he did not want war with the USA. He wanted to actually fix the USSR uh, in their domestic policy. So he had two of those policies. The Soviet economy was struggling, so he had perestroika to fix that, stop military spending. And people started losing faith in communism, so he needed glasnost, which allowed less censorship and people to gain a bit more trust in the communist way of government. Now we're going to head forward to the 1990-1991 conflict in the Persian Gulf, known as the Gulf War. So this is where Iraq invaded Kuwait because they wanted to secure more oil reserves. And a lot of the conflict we've actually seen in the Middle East uh, is usually related around oil. The US, the UK, and other allies, they sent forces to Saudi Arabia to protect the Saudis. Now, this quickly forced the Iraqi troops out of Kuwait and back into Iraq in less than a week. Uh, but they did not invade Iraq, but instead they encouraged the people there to overthrow the dictator named Saddam Hussein. So we can see a map here. We see where all of these oil reserves are, and we can see Kuwait. Uh, as a country here. So these are all the oil reserves that the Iraqis were looking to take. Now to protect the Saudis, that's why the USA, the UK, they sent forces into the Gulf to try and relieve all the tension between those two nations. So let's record those four key points in our notes and then we can go ahead and resume. So before we finish off our final tasks of our lesson, we have two more readings to look at. So as before, pause the video, skim through the reading. Let's look at Reagan, the Second Cold War, and the SDI, also known as Star Wars. And here we have a diagram uh, of how Star Wars was intended to work. We know it didn't, uh, but this was the plan that Reagan had come up with. Okay, as before, pause the video, have a look at change in Reagan and Gorbachev. And last but not least, our final reading before completing our tasks, we have some more information about Glasnost and Perestroika. So your task today is to summarize the efforts of both Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev 
and how they were planning to end the Cold War. So use the readings on the previous two slides, and what we're going to look at is the following. So make two key points for the SDI. Uh, find a definition and a key point for Glasnost, a definition and a key point for Perestroika, and two key points for the arms race.